Hello everyone, my name is Christian. Welcome back to TechPoint. Today our guest is Emmet, the CEO at Rewardful. Hello. Hi, Christian. Nice to meet you. At first, please tell us what your company does. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, Rewardful is um, very simply an affiliate tracking and management solution for um, SaaS companies. So if you want to set up a, an affiliate program or a customer referral program for your SaaS business, then uh, yeah, come check out Rewardful. <laughs> okay, and how does it work? Is it more like a marketplace where affiliates and uh, SaaS vendors come in, or, or how does it work? So Rewardful is um, for businesses that want to set up their own self-managed affiliate program. So okay. unlike, for example, if you think about like sort of classical affiliate networks, like say uh, Commission Junction or something like that, um, Rewardful doesn't provide a marketplace or a network like that. Um, we allow companies to just set up and manage their own affiliate program. Right. Um, and um, as a result, you know, compared to say like Commission Junction or Impact would be more of a, would be one that's um, in the um, SaaS space. We don't take any fees off of um, uh, the commissions you pay out or the, the revenue that you're, that you're making. Um, so it's much more affordable than some of those kind of classical ones. All right, let's take a quick break and introduce you to Dealfront. Now, we all know that getting through to decision makers can feel like breaking through a fortress. But picture this, a tool that not only promises but delivers. Imagine if your sales and marketing team could target ideal fit leads and close deals all within a single platform. And that platform is Dealfront. How is Dealfront different? Its revenue engine is fueled by live European data in multiple languages, providing you with insights and access that other tools simply can't match. No more struggling to find the right decision makers. With Dealfront, it's as easy as few clicks. Here's the magic. With Dealfront, you can harness three layers of data, market signals, web visitors, and EU company databases. And there's no need to worry about compliance. Dealfront meets Europe's strict standards, ensuring GDPR compliance and competitors can match. Ready to revolutionize your approach to leads and deals? Grab your free demo today at dealfront.com. That's D-E-A-L-F-R-O-N. Com. Don't miss out on the future of successful deal making with Dealfront. Thank you so much, Dealfront, for sponsoring this episode. Now let's get back to it. What do you say are the most loved features of the platform? Um, so there's a there's a a couple sort of core things. So obviously, um, one of the big selling points for Rewardful is the ease of use and ease of setup. So it's it's very easy to to integrate Rewardful into your um, billing system, whether that's uh, Paddle or Stripe. Stripe being the most popular. Obviously, anyone who's you know in in the world of SaaS, uh, you know, knows who uh, Stripe is, and probably a lot of people know Paddle. So, yes, um, ease of use, ease of setup. That's that's sort of the the recurring thing that most people um, come to us. You know, uh, and that's kind of what they're um, they're looking for. Um, and um, and then from there, you know. If you need to set up multiple different campaigns to track performance of different groups of affiliates or setting up, whether it's um, customer referral programs or affiliate programs, um, it's, you know, it's very easy to, to set up either of those types of different programs. Um, very easy to, to pay out your affiliates, all the sort of just stock standard sort of things that you need to, um, to you know, set up an affiliate or customer referral program. Um, we also have a developer's API. So if you want to do something that's a little bit more, uh, let's say creative, um, then there's a lot of flexibility with that as well. And a lot of our customers would, uh, would make use of that as well. Okay. That's awesome. Usually what's your typical customer or when do SaaS companies launch their own affiliate program? How do you see the space? Um, one of the, one of the things that, um, I'll often say to people, people ask me like, you know, what's, um, what are the characteristics of a SaaS business that is going to do well with affiliate yes. marketing? Yes. Um, and there's, there's a few characteristics. Um, probably the most important thing to think about is, um, the, if you think about like SaaS businesses as a spectrum. So if on one end of the spectrum, you have, self-serve or we might say in the industry like plg you know product-led product-led growth yes. someone can just you know put down their credit card and pay yes if that's on one end of the spectrum and, and then the other end of the spectrum if you have sales-led growth where 
you know, there's no way to pay for yourself and, you know, you've got to talk to a salesperson. The further you yes. are towards this end of the spectrum where self-serve, that's, that's very important, right? So there needs to be a very clear path where someone can go and, and sign up themselves. Um, if you're sales led, it's, it's probably just not going to be a, a particularly good fit. Um, so tend, tend to be, um, things that are going to have like, at the very least, like a, maybe not, um, doesn't have to be like a super low price point, but you know, it's, it's going to be a little bit lower comp priced compared to say, um, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're talking in terms of like annual contract value of $10,000 and these kinds of things, like it, you know, it's, it starts to get a little bit harder to, to make an affiliate program work. Um, it's not to say it can't work at all, but you know, you want to be closer to that self-serve side of the spectrum to make things work. Yeah, um, absolutely. The other thing that I often say is you want to have, um, ideally a customer base that like hangs out online, right? So, um, if you're if you're serving other software companies, that's probably pretty good, right? Your your customer yes. base are going to be people that are hanging out on Twitter or LinkedIn and, and so forth, right? Um, let's say, for example, to contrast that, you're trying to sell your software to um, accountants and lawyers and doctors and, and so on and so forth, like customers that don't spend their time hanging out online. Um, it's going to be difficult, right, to to find affiliates that can get in front of those audiences, right? Um, it's not to say that it's not possible. We have customers that are setting up affiliate programs in um, environments that aren't necessarily selling to indie hackers or, or things like that. Um, but it's it's an important sort of characteristic to keep in mind that um, the more likely you're customers are to hang out line online the easier it is going to be to to find affiliates and um running an affiliate program finding affiliates is one of the most important things right to actually find people that are willing and able to promote your product that's a, a pretty important characteristic so um yeah there's probably a million and one other sort of characteristics we can maybe outline but i would say those are probably two of the most important ones to um to keep in mind one other thing I will add, though, before we move on, is um, a common thing I often see is businesses who are not only trying to launch their affiliate program, but they're trying to launch their business, right? Like, they don't even have any customers yet. Yes. And we definitely see it. We have some case studies, actually, of, of businesses who have launched their business using affiliate marketing. Okay. And um, well. it definitely happens. Like... Um, uh, but what I would say is it's harder, yeah. right? Because then you're not just answering the question of does affiliate marketing work for my business? You're also trying to answer the question of, do I have a business here? Do I have a product that people actually want to buy? And, um, affiliates can't solve that for you, right? Affiliates can just drive traffic, right? Um, and so if you've got other problems with your funnel, let's say, right? Like your, your conversion from your, website to your product and so forth. You just built a product that people don't want. Um, and an affiliate program is not going to solve that problem for you. Of so <laughs> if you've ideally, you should have some semblance of product market fit or some semblance of something that people want. And, um, again, as I said, we have seen people very successfully launch their business, um, using affiliate marketing, but it is definitely, uh, what I might say is hard mode. Um, in terms of setting up your affiliate program. So, um, so yeah, that those are definitely some considerations to, to keep in mind in terms of, are you going to be a good fit for affiliate marketing? Thank you for sharing. You explained it really well. I, I appreciate that. Uh, how competitive is your market and how do you differentiate? And if you, if you let me add, if you see this problem of uh, finding affiliates, why didn't you also think about creating your own marketplace? Um, so I'll, I'll take the last question, uh, first. So in terms yes. of building our own marketplace, um, it's, it's definitely something like we constantly contemplate. Um, yeah. and, um, I think if we were to, to build our own, our own marketplace, um, I don't know how much the actually like finding of affiliates is, is going to be the reason to do it. 
um, it might be part of the reason to do it, but um, you know, part of the reason to do it might be more about making things a bit easier for customers on like facilitating payments and things like that. Right. So like um, getting involved in that piece of the equation, but in terms of finding the affiliates, the, the problem with, with marketplaces um, and anyone who's joined a marketplace is, is going to probably tell you this is um, unless you're absolutely like a, a market leader in, in your space, um, what you're, what you're going to find is most of the affiliates are going to uh, in the marketplace. They're just going to go and look for like the biggest programs that are on the marketplace to promote. Right. Um, that's one, one piece of it. Right. So unless you're one of those biggest programs, it, it's hard to, in that space to like, how do you yeah. stand out amongst them? Right. If, if you're hoping that the affiliate's going to pick you, um, this is, this is the problem with, with marketplaces, people think it's going to solve the problem of like, oh, affiliates are just going to come to me and I'm not going to do anything. It, it maintains this kind of mindset of passivity. Like I, I just going to sign up. Yes. People will sign up for me and the, <laughs> uh, for my affiliate program. And the, pro that mindset is a problem. If you're trying to, if you're trying to build an, uh, an affiliate program and, and recruit affiliates, um, the, the good affiliates, the ones that you want to actually have join your program, you need to think of as more like partners. And if you're just thinking them as like these, these tra transactional relationships, they're like faceless, they're going to sign up, they're going to send me, you know, customers. Um, you're probably going to be disappointed yes. because what, what tends to, what tends to happen if you take this kind of passive approach and, Oh, I'll just get the affiliates to come to me is um, the affiliates you, you will oftentimes find are going to be the more mercenary types of affiliates the the ones that are they're just going to use google ads to promote you they're just going to try and game your program until you kick them out um to find some sort of like a financial arbitrage opportunity as opposed to their actual partner who's relevant within whatever your space is right and so the advice we always give people when you're trying to recruit affiliates as i said before is treat them like partners and recruit people that you'd actually want to be working with right and so if you're just going to passively sit back and wait for someone to find you, it, that's probably not going to be the way. And so the way to go and actually find affiliates is to be proactive and do research to figure out what are the types of people that I want promoting me. And these are going to be people that have some sort of traffic source that is relevant to what you sell, or maybe more put more importantly, your product is relevant to their audience, right? So, um, they could be some sort of thought leader in a space. They could be someone who in some cases might have a, re a review site, you know, um, a lot of Just like sites, us. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of re review sites, they, they don't do affiliate programs yep. anymore for like PPC and, and things like that. But some people yes. will just set up sort of small review sites and that'd be in kind of a particular niche or vertical and the way they might monetize could be through um, affiliate programs if they're smaller. Um, it could be someone who just creates content around a particular audience or, or vertical. And they're looking for ways to, to monetize that audience. Um, and oftentimes they're looking for interesting things to talk to their audience about. That could be new tools and SaaS products and things like that. So, um, there's, there's a whole sort of, you know, um, spiel I could kind of go into to ex explain, um, in, in a bit more depth, but that's kind of at the root of it, right? Like you want to be looking for people who are actually like a really good fit for promoting your product as opposed to, I'm just going to go to marketplace and, magically like a, a super affiliate is going to sign up for my program and send me a bunch of money. And so that's, that, that's kind of the, the ruse of yes. um, the bait and switch or the false promise of yeah. um, marketplaces and networks is that you're just going to sign up and, and magically, magically you're going to start earning money. And um, that almost always ends up being um, disappointing for the, the businesses that use Rewardful, and we pay close attention to a lot of our customers and what they're up to. Um, for the customers who are doing really well, and the programs are doing really well, um, the recruiting of, of affiliates stops being as much of the issue and it becomes more around like managing of the affiliates and um, dealing with bad behavior of these kind of mercenary style affiliates that I, that I mentioned, right? Um, and so, if you're 
trying to get affiliates in this kind of passive way, I'll just, you know, get a network that's, you're going to get a lot of that. So anyways, um, it, it's something like we, we wrestle with, um, a lot in terms of like, what's the best way to, to kind of approach these problems. Um, one of the things that we, that we've been working on is education. So, um, we're actually probably just a few weeks away, depending on when this, uh, actually goes live, um, uh, from launching a, a pretty comprehensive course on nice. affiliate marketing and it, recruiting affiliates is one of the topics nice. um, that'll be in there. And we'll add more content o- over time as well. Cause it's a recurring question, you know, how do I, yeah. how do I recruit of affiliates? Course. Um, uh, and, um, to your to your other questions um in terms of the space you know yes. uh, affiliate tracking software for for saas businesses yes um it's uh it certainly feels like it's got a lot more competitive in in the last little while um what i would say is like you know if you can if you compare it to say like the crm uh industry it's not it's not very competitive right like in crm there's just so many different options so many different sort of like niche CRMs and not niche CRMs and, and so forth, right? So it's it's not as big of a space like that or like uh, email marketing automation or yes. one of these types of um, spaces. Project management. Yeah, exactly, exactly, right? Um, but um, yeah, it's certainly, I think it's gotten quite a bit more competitive in um, even just like the last few months, uh, it's it started to get a lot more competitive. Um, and um, one of the, one of the things that we we've, as I you know I said before, is um, we've tried to stay stay true to is maintaining this ease of use, ease of ease of setup, um, and that's something that we try to really keep in mind when it comes to working on the product. Um, it can be very easy to fall into that like one more feature trap and just add more and more and more stuff, and then. Before you know yes. it, like you're no longer easy to use and easy to set up and, and all this kind of stuff. So that's something that we've tried to play, tried to be somewhat disciplined about and, um, uh, to maintain that ethos of, um, ease of use. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, hopefully, hopefully we do, uh, a good job of that, um, over time. So <laughs> that, that was a great answer. Thank you so much and really insightful. Uh, I think we can get some great takeaways from that. But my next question would be about the company and the story. Uh, please tell us the founding story behind it and how you became the CEO. Sure. So um, I'll do my best on the on the founding story. I, I do know the founders, but you know I might not know all of the sort of details. Yes. But um, so Rewardful was started, um, I believe, sort of like the first customers um, started in August of 2018. Um, okay. And so Rewardful was founded by uh, two Canadians, um, Brady Cassidy and Kyle Fox. They're uh, from a city in Canada called Edmonton. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, yeah, they started it in 2018. Um, and as far as I know, like they, they ran the business um, fully bootstrapped as like a side project for the first, I think, like two or two and a half years. Okay. Um, Maybe something like that, yeah. Like two, first two and a half years, something like that. Uh, basically, like up until a few months before they sold the business to to SaaS Group, um, they'd run it as a, as a side project. Um, and um, uh, yeah, just like you know, really trying to scratch their own itch. Um, you know, both of them had been had been working in you know, software as a service yeah. industry for, for several years, worked on a number of different SaaS products. Um, and, um, you know, looking for a solution that was easy to set up using Stripe primarily at that point in time, paddle came, um, just within the last year and a bit. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think, you know, like the, the market really took it and they, they grew incredibly quickly over the first two and a half years. Um, they got acquired in, I think it was October or November of 2001. Uh, so a little bit more than two years ago. And then, um, I, I started shortly after that. Um, and 
uh, the founders were still around for another maybe like nine, nine or 10 months after I joined. And then in October, November, first week of November in 2022, yeah. they, they left. And, um, at that point in time, we actually SaaS group. So I, I was basically working as a product manager at that point in time. Okay. And, um, uh, SaaS group started an external search for a CEO at that point in time. Um, but for sort of like an, on an unofficial interim basis from about like November until let's say November 22 until maybe March 23, I was kind of like an unofficial interim CEO and, um, mm-hmm. you know, d- doing whatever sort of basically, you know, Brady had been the CEO and, and Kyle had been the CTO. And, um, uh, one of the dev team, Chris Cottom came in as CTO and there was no one in for CEO. So I was kind of doing some of the, the stuff basically that, that Brady would have been doing when he was still in the business. And, um, things seemed to be going kind of okay. And, uh, I basically just pitched the, the founders of SaaS group and said, like, Hey, would you, you know, give me a few months trying this and nice. see, you know, like, am nice. I like doing an okay job? And, um, yeah, the first, whatever call it like, uh, seven, eight months of me as a, you know, interim CEO went well. And so we, we formalized it, um, in August of 23. So I guess it's been, I don't know, maybe four or five months now that I've been officially CEO, maybe a year, like unofficially, uh, a CEO. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, things have, have gone well. We, um, uh, have pretty much doubled the size of the business, uh, in terms of, um, uh, ARR. And we've gone from a team of four people to nine people, uh, soon to be 10 people. We're, we're hiring another support person. Um, and, uh, mostly, um, mostly development and sort of product related. Um, but, uh, some people in marketing and, and then, um, it's an interesting environment to, to work in a SaaS company that's owned by something like SaaS group. Um, it, the way I've described it, um, to Kyle Fox, who was the, the former CTO and, and co-founder, um, was that it, it kind of feels like running a SaaS company with training wheels because, you know, you've kind of, of course, yeah. you know, you're running yeah. a SaaS business, but then, you know, you've got some support like, you know, um, SaaS group, they do HR. So when it comes to recruiting or handling any kind of, you know, HR stuff, um, yes. you know, they're, they're there, which is, which is helpful. Um, finance, you know, the help of finance. Um, they've got a central marketing team, which acts kind of almost like an agency that we can get additional resources to when we need them. Like, um, you know, shortly after the acquisition didn't have much of a marketing team. So then it's like, they can help with, you know, uh, SEO and PPC and, and other kind of marketing stuff. Um, there's a product team. So if, you know, you want some, uh, help on design, you know, they can kind of give you a fractional designer and, and things like that. So this is amazing. Um, <laughs> and then you can, you can just focus on like the core product and go to market function for your particular business. Um, and you know, as someone who is new to, to this type of leadership role, that was um, an enormously helpful way to get exposure to that. So, so this was uh, your first time being a CEO, right? Um, not, well, not technically, but yes. So what I would, I would say like for all uh, intents and purposes, tell us yes. the story, tell us the story, how I start your career. I think it's easier. Yeah. So I, um, I won't, I won't tell the whole, my whole career, but uh, maybe the, the role that I'm referring to that might be relevant was, um, in 2015, I had started a, a healthcare software startup and, okay. um, Kyle Fox, the, the, former CTO and, and co-founder of Rewardful was my co-founder on that startup actually. Um, ah, okay. And so we, we had worked together previously. Nice. Um, and just also knew each other just from like the local startup community in our, in our city. I, I grew up in the same city as, as Kyle did. And, um, Brady Cassidy lived in this, in the same place as well. He was, you know, we had known each other as well, just from like the startup community. Um, but, uh, anyways, Kyle and I had started this software company called Care Network, um, which, uh, failed, uh, you know, it didn't, didn't get off the ground. And, um, Kyle started Rewardful, um, uh, a year or two after that. Um, but, um, 
I, I, so technically my title was, was CEO, yes. but like, you know, it, it's like people who start a startup and, you know, there's one or two people and they call themselves CEO. It, yeah. You know, yeah. It's not, <laughs> it's, a, it's in a startup context that, yeah, but you know, I didn't really have much in the way of management responsibility or responsibility to other people or, you know, um, as far as that, like PL goes, you know, there was only L, there was no P on, on, <laughs> on the PL, right? So, um, not not a lot of responsibility, but uh, yeah. Okay, and uh, what would be your best piece of advice for a starting founder? Oh, um, that's uh, oh, that's a tough one because like I've, I'd have a a lot of sort of scar tissue from you know doing my own thing before. There's probably a lot of different pieces of advice. Um, be very difficult to say like what's the best one. Um, I think um, I think okay. I, I'll say a couple things. So one, I think um, bootstrap is over is underrated. Boot bootstrapping is underrated. I think too many people. Um, are just so focused on like raising money and they can't do anything unless they raise money. Like there's, there's a yeah. lot of this kind of mentality. I'm actually, I'm, I'm in a WhatsApp group um, in here in Ireland. It's like a startup networking sort of WhatsApp group. And someone posted something recently about like, you know, really struggling to find funding, et cetera, et cetera. And they've been working on this thing for, I don't know, however, a couple of years or something and haven't been able to get traction because they, they can't get funding. And, and I see this kind of stuff all the time. I was that person a number of years ago. Um, and I think if you need funding to do whatever the thing is that you want to do, unless it's some sort of like deep tech thing or, or whatever, like for most people, like that's not the case, right? Like you're, if you're building some sort of like SaaS product or something like that, right. um, you know, uh, you're probably don't need to do that. So like bootstrapping is underrated. Um, and what I would add to that too um, is don't quit your day job until it actually makes sense. And you could take yeah. the guys at Rewardful, Colin Brady has great examples of that. They bootstrapped yes. Rewardful as a side project and got to the point where it was successful enough to be bought by a private equity company, SaaS Group. Yes. Um, and like they didn't quit their jobs until like, a few months before they sold the company and they had already had um, acquisition sort of overtures by that point in time. Right. So um, yeah, I, I think like, I just see so many people making that mistake of like, Oh, I need to go raise money. I need to quit my job and go like full time into this thing. It's not a thing yet. You know what I mean? Like you don't have a, they don't have a business yet. Like there's, there's no reason that there's no traction, yes. you know, for them to like need to like quit their job. Right. So yeah. um I I think uh yeah that that would be that be my, th and there's so many things you can kind of tease out of that like um like don't take on the financial risk of like quitting your job uh until like you've got something that re can replace your income um don't if you need money to like succeed in a space or even not even succeed but just to get started in a space maybe you're not the right person to be starting something in that space Right, like, may, or maybe, maybe to be more sort of generous, it's like maybe you need a partner who can yes. help you, as opposed to oh, I'm going to hire a CTO. I need funding so I can go and hire a CTO. It's like no, no, no. Like, if you can't sell sell a co-founder on starting this thing to bootstrap with you, then how are you going to sell <laughs> the I, market on this I, thing? Right. So, I, anyways, there's all sorts of uh, sort of uh, derivations of this particular idea, right? But basically, like. Don't yeah, bootstrapping is underrated. If you can't start a company with without bootstrapping to some level of traction, then like don't don't bother. Great one, I love it. I have one last question. Uh, you already shared the men's value, and I really enjoyed this podcast. Uh, what's your favorite software product that you use? Your favorite SaaS, but apart from Rewardful. Well, I can tell you what I don't like that everyone raves about. I'll, I'll maybe I'll start. With, I gotta go to the counterpoint. Um, okay. I re I really dislike Notion. I know like so many people like Notion, and yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm not um, 
uh, I'm like a, I'm a Google Docs guy. Give me Google <laughs> Docs. I'll take I'll take that. Um, yeah. uh, Google Docs, Google Sheets. I, I think you know I, I use that over Notion. In terms of stuff I do like, um, we use Asana a lot. I think Asana is well done. Um, Asana. Yeah, Asana's pretty good. We use it. Um, yeah. Intercom, you know, we, we kind of can't live with without it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't use a lot of like really. You know, maybe this is bad of me. Like, uh, you know, a lot of our sort of customers are indie hacker types and stuff like this. But like, you know, we we use a lot of. And maybe it's just the where we're at, kind of in the maturity of our our business. We're you know using what? a lot more sort of established stuff, um, and and very kind of vanilla. You know, like. You know, Intercom, pretty pretty big, well known brand. We just got HubSpot for our CRM. Um, Google, Google, you know, the Google Workspace suite and all that for all those kind of productivity um, tools. So yeah, I'm I'm happy to go with sort of the old conservative conservative SaaS tools. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Is there anything else that you want to tell us today on the podcast? Um. Yeah, let me just quickly pull something up here. Um, make sure I've got the right URL. Okay, so I mentioned earlier we've got this course that's coming out uh, very soon. Um, and depending on when this gets published, maybe the course will be available. Um, so if it's not published yet, it'll be a wait list and you'll get notified yeah. when it's launched. Um, but go to rewardful.com slash course. And mm -hmm. you can pre-register for our wait list and we'll notify you when the course becomes available. Um, and if this, you know, uh, podcast is published later or you just happen to be watching or listening to this podcast later, um, rewardful.com slash course will redirect you to the, um, registration page for the course. Uh, we've got more than two hours worth of content. Um, I think like 12 or 13 videos outlining, you know, everything you need to understand in terms of, you know, how to set up a successful affiliate program for your SaaS business. Um, so yeah, rewardful.com slash course. That's, yeah, that's my last parting thought, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll put it in the description for everybody to check it out. I think it's super valuable. And uh, I see you as an expert in affiliate marketing space. Thank you for the podcast. Thank you for all the value shared. And uh, yeah, I'm grateful. Thanks for joining us. Great. Well, yeah, thanks for having me, Christian. I, I appreciate it and it was good to meet you. <laughs>